Real life science. So, uh, right off the bat, I want to hit up a couple things. China launched five more spy satellites on Long March 2D rockets from Jiangxi Air Base. And what they are openly saying is, this is our preparation for war. Damn. They said that about the 100 new nuclear missiles that they're getting. Now, I'll point out that the U.S. has already over like 600, so whatever. But like, they're not saying, oh, we want this for defense. They're saying about all this, this is preparations for war. They are actively flying missions over Taiwan to antagonize them because they want to mark out exactly where all the radar locations are and the missile locations. This is not saber rattling. And I feel like everyone is just like, oh, China, that's so quaint and ignoring them. And it's like, it scares me that they're saying, no, no, we're getting ready for war. Um... I'm going to skip the Cassini one because I know that Tweaked is doing a thing on that. Scientists have detected possible proof of plate tectonics on Venus. This is huge. This is very, very big. Um, check out Space Time with Stuart Gary, the episode from July 14th, 2021, season 24, episode 80. It has details on that. Um you know, the moon and Mars, the, the core has cooled down and the mantle and the crust have cooled down to the point that they've gotten thick and they can't have sort of tectonic activities. Not so with Venus. It doesn't look like it does for us because Venus has pressures of over 900 times that of Earth and temperatures of over well over 400 degrees Celsius such that the surface temperature of Venus melts lead. But they still have what we're now seeing as like, hey, this is legitimately tectonic activity. This is this is this is interesting. And the last thing I want to hit on mine is the sun emitted its first X class solar flare of the solar cycle 25, the most powerful um, um, solar flares, which are the X class. It it came from uh, Sun SPOA AD two eight three eight. It was triggered. Uh, it triggered two CMEs, which are coronal mass ejections. Thankfully, that even though so the way that it, uh, a, a a X class solar flare works is that it travels at the speed of light, but the coronal mass ejections go much slower. So by the time the coronal mass ejections came out. They were actually aimed away from the Earth, thank God. Uh, mm -hmm. But the no NASA Solar Observatory caught it. Uh, the actual pulse X-rays created a uh, magnetic uh, crochet that ionized the Earth's upper atmosphere. It caused massive radio disturbances. It started to push away the magnetization uh magnetization sorry of the earth for a short time this is the first since 2017 uh which was you know so cycle 24 lasted for 11 years and then ended cycle 25 is now upon us and scientists are just starting to put together really reasonable hypotheses that it could be that the cycles have something to do with the changing of the center of the mass of our solar system. So the Earth is 90, or sorry, the Sun is 99% of the mass of our solar system. So normally the barysphere, which is like the center point where everything in the solar system revolves, is inside of the Sun. Not in the very, very middle, but in somewhere inside of the mass or the area, the surface area of the Sun. But Every once in a while, you get a situation where Jupiter and Saturn are on the same side. They're close enough together where it pulls the barysphere of our 
solar system just outside of the internal area of the sun and it lasts that that ends up happening for like 11 years and scientists are saying hmm that's weird that happens for 11 years and the solar cycle happens for 11 years we're not exactly sure how or why but maybe those two things are related it's interesting stuff it's one of those situations where like us mostly hairless monkeys living on this planet playing star citizen and elite dangerous and no man's sky and doing a stupid podcast where we get drunk and talk about space games for a couple hours on a friday night we take a lot of things for granted some of which are the fact that like at any point that ball of fire in the sky could fuck us all and we have no way of knowing <laughs> if like hey every 12,000 years there's a strong enough uh you know solar flare or whatever that it would like oh it would fry all electronics we're starting back over in the you know ye olden fucking mormon times or 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 amish rather times or oh yeah that's like the one that's like pulse b or that's the one that's this and that that melted the ice you know the ice sheets over north america and caused a flood or what like we could literally at any moment get sent back to the stone age so let's a science the fuck out of shit as quickly as possible so that we can figure stuff out b become a multi-planet species as soon as possible so that we have redundancies that can save us and c appreciate what we got while we got it and that's me out of sciencey stuff next up is katie you have something about alamar so um maybe <laughs> yeah alamar was the uae hope mission right oh okay yeah yeah so the U uae the united arab emirates space agency their hope mission arrived on in mars uh this year and they have discovered aurora in the atmosphere of mars um this was a bit of a mystery because obviously mars has no magnetic field um which is what causes aurora here on earth um, interaction with the, the solar wind and Earth's magnetic um, field in the atmosphere causes the aurora. Um, but the theory here is that it is the result of something called induced magnetosphere. Uh, this also seems to exist on Venus, where it's caused by the interaction of the solar wind with the upper, upper atmosphere. Uh, with Mars, it is theorized that it's caused by magnetism in the planetary crust, causing an induced magnetosphere. Um, and it's very interesting, obviously, for them to to um, study this, um, as it may give indications, may give further evidence and indications as, as to why Mars lost its atmosphere, why why the atmosphere of Mars has been stripped away. Um, so certainly, it's extreme, an extremely interesting discovery. Absolutely, yeah. that is so. The United Arab Emirates sent up Alamar, which is hope. The Chinese sent up, what is it, Tianwen One, and 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 we sent up Mars Twenty Twenty. Um, three awesome missions doing high level science, and God bless all of them. Good stuff, Roy. Or was it? Nope. Tweaked is next. Tweak, yeah. Tweaked next. All right. Well. New study came out today with some interesting stuff. The methane wafting from the Enceladus may be a sign life teams in Saturn moon's subsurface sea, they're saying. <clears throat> in 2005, NASA's Cassini orbiter discovered geysers blasting particles of water ice into space from tiger stripe fractures near Enceladus South Pole. This material, which forms a plume that feeds Saturn's E ring, which is the planet's outermost ring, is thought to come from a huge ocean of liquid water that sloshes beneath the moon's icy shell. But there's more than just water in this plume, they found out. During numerous flybys, Cassini spotted many other compounds, for example, dehydrogen, which we've been shooting a lot of in No Man's Sky, by the way, a variety of carbon containing organic compounds, including methane. The dehydrogen and methane really intrigued the astrologist because H2 is likely being produced by the interaction of rock and hot water on Enceladus seafloor. 
suggesting that the moon has a deep sea hydrothermal vent or many of them hydrothermal vents, the same type of environment that many believe led to life here on Earth. In addition, the H2 provides energy for some of Earth's microbes that produce methane from carbon dioxide. Something very similar could be happening on Enceladus because they have found large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane in these plumes as well. So what they're saying basically is a perfect storm of what they believe was the cradle of life here on Earth appears to be happening on the sea floor of this icy moon uh, or icy ring here on the Saturn's moons. Pretty interesting stuff and, and good info from this probe that's been going around. So, a hundred percent, just life out there, possibly exciting. A hundred percent, even more exciting. Like you're absolutely right, Tweak. That uh, what you're uh, what you're talking about is a hundred percent true. That the methane, dihydrogen, and carbon uh, dioxide are all signs of the hydrothermal vents on Earth. But the difference is that the levels of methane far exceed what we get from hydrothermal vents on Earth. So the only reason why scientists can figure out, like either A, there's something weird going on there which we don't have on Earth, or B, this is evidence of not only hydrothermal vents, but methogenics. Methogenesis is a, well, I mean, there's two types of methogenesis. There's geothermal and biomethogenesis. Biomethogenesis are the single cell organisms, or, and in some cases, multi-cell organisms that, like you just said, was believed to be the original like life forms on Earth. Uh, that that we all evolved from eventually and if it's like if the math holds up and it's like okay this is proof that there's either a something on Enceladus that we don't have on earth or b that is the vents and the methogenesis that would be okay there is absolutely life on Enceladus at that point now we have missions that are going back we've got the the uh um oh what is it they the the the, the european space the esa they have a, a thing on uh that's that's going back that's going to try to collect direct samples from the geyser plume from the spray and that would be amazing that would give us some actual detailed information. Um, Wolf, you had something? So with, with the possibility of life on Enceladus, um, the thought that I immediately had was this would be a great way to test uh, panspermia, i.e. we send a probe there, collect a sample, look and see what happens when we look for DNA, and if the DNA is similar to things we have on Earth, then that brings up a whole bunch of interesting questions about life. That it does. And you had something on um, Hades? Oh, it was just the um, what the aurora were. It's, uh, so you have the high energy particles coming in from the sun. They hit the magnetosphere of the Earth. And they follow the magnetic lines of force down, which brings them into the atmosphere. And when those particles interact with gas molecules, not unlike how a neon sign works, the gas molecules will then emit light. And that's how we get Aurora. Absolutely. Uh, Roy, you're up. Yeah, so continuing our coverage of farts in space, uh, a group of scientists may have just pinpointed the location on Mars of another mysterious source of methane, a gas most often produced by microbes. And NASA's, here's the exciting part, NASA's Curiosity rover could be right on top of it. So methane blips have pinged on Curiosity's detection systems six times since the rover landed in Mars's Gale Crater in 2012, but scientists weren't able to find a source for them. Now with a new analysis, researchers have, uh, may have traced the methane to its origin. The findings point to an active emission region uh, to the west and southwest 
of the Curiosity rover on the northwestern crater floor. Um, this is what they wrote in their paper. It's quite a coincidence that they selected a landing site for Curiosity that happens to be located next to an active methane emission site. So this prospect is thrilling for scientists as almost all of the methane in Earth's atmosphere has biological origins, according to researchers, so that a signature on Mars could be a key signpost for finding life on the ostensibly desolate planet. And even if it's being produced by non-biological processes, it could point to geological activity closely tied to the presence of liquid water, uh, obviously a vital ingredient for past or present life to thrive. Uh, Curiosity detected the methane blips through an instrument called the Tunable Laser Spectrometer, which is capable of detecting trace quantities of the gas at less than one half part per billion, or about the quantity of a pinch of salt dropped into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, the meth methane spikes that led the team to the potential source were registered at roughly 10 parts per billion. Uh, so though we don't still don't know whether the methane comes from tiny life forms, um, the detectable lifespan of methane is only 330 years. After this, it's completely destroyed by exposure to sunlight. This means that whatever produced the methane could still be producing it today. So their next job will be to find out what is that something? Uh, I think that Talix001 in the chat has the answer. Guys, it's invisible farting cows. I'm telling you. <laughs> All right. Rain, bring it on home. And reporting from Space News in Washington, D.C., NASA is seeking proposals for a progress to support the development of commercial space stations, even as funding for that effort is in jeopardy in Congress. NASA published a request for proposals on the 12th of July for its Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program. That effort, announced earlier this year, will provide funding for initial studies of commercial space stations that could ultimately be used by NASA and other customers. Proposals are due to the agency by the 26th of August. NASA also expects to award between two and four Space Act agreements to support those studies, with up to $400 million in funding available from fiscal years 2022 through 2025. NASA also anticipates a second phase of the program to start in 2026, where the agency would certify commercial space stations for use by both NASA payloads and astronauts. Hell yes. I dig it. I'm a big fan. 